So I think maybe what I'll talk to you about is, uh, is vision. So first of all, um, I'm very happy to be here speaking to all of you. One of the things we wanted to do right from the beginning of this organization is to make sure that we identified a large group of young people, and that's you, by the way, and, uh, and help. In, we picked all of you very carefully. And we picked you because you had already demonstrated in one way or another that you were doing something to aim up and that you were communicating that. Now, you know, I've been thinking about how to conceptualize the world and our place in it for a long time. And one of the misconceptualizations that lead people into a dismal nihilism is it's a linear conception of the relationship between people. So if you imagine yourself for a moment as one speck among seven billion specks, then you're going to immediately leap to the conclusion that nothing that you could do could possibly matter. Um, now, there's a payoff to that, because if nothing you do matters, then you can get away with anything. And so when you're feeling nihilistic, you have to ask yourself the question whether or not you're actually hopeless or whether you're just looking for an excuse for selfish nihilism and for selfish hedonism. And I think the latter is very much worth considering. But I also think that's a very bad model of the way that the realm of human experience is constructed. And you can think about it mathematically very rapidly in a much more instructive sense. So you know, there is a notion, a metaphysical notion, that each of us stands at the center of the cosmos um, in some strange way. And that seems impossible because we are accustomed to assuming that everything we under that we understand has a single center. But there's lots of things about the way existence lays itself out that we don't understand. And it is possible for something sufficiently complex to have multiple centers. And I think each of, we are, we're all conscious and that's a mystery in and of itself. And each of those consciousnesses is a kind of center. Now, so, and then you think, well, what does, what, what potentiality does that center have? And you can think very rapidly that certainly in the, in the, in the span of your life, if you're reasonably fortunate, you're going to have a thousand people that you have very close encounters with. It, that the manner in which you conduct your life is going to have a substantive effect on at least a thousand people. And so, and each of those thousand people are in contact with a thousand people, and that's a million people, one person out from you, and it's a billion people, two people out from you. And so we're each at the center of a network like that, and that means two things. It means that the stupid, miserable, resentful, bitter things you do have a lot more cataclysmic effect on the way the world unfolds than you think. And that's worth thinking about. But it also means that the good that you do can have a much broader effect than you might think, especially if you buy the one speck among seven billion specs model. You know, and the thing is too, it's what you do as an individual doesn't just radiate out from you spatially, it also radiates out from you temporally. So if you have the adventure of having a child, for example, you have no idea what the overall consequence of that is going to be as the generations cascade out into the future. And so it is the case that you stand at the center of things. And one of the things we wanted to do when bringing all of you relatively young people together was to drive that point home. You know, you're not here, and I think you know that, but you're not here to listen to experts tell you how you should conduct your life. You're here to be encouraged to take, to take yourselves as responsible entities of intrinsic worth seriously, and also to contemplate the possibility that you have something very real to offer the world very real, and that the world itself will be much less than it could be if you fail to bring that forward. And I believe firmly, I truly believe this, that the world degenerates into hell when people hide their light under a bushel. If enough people do that, it's hell. And enough people stop doing that, well then we move incrementally uphill towards the promised land on the hill, let's say. And I think that's as I think that's as realistic a way of conceiving the world as can possibly be put forward. There's nothing about that that's high in the sky or naive dreaming. It, quite the contrary, in fact, because quite, it puts quite a burden on you. You don't get to mess about. The stupid things you do matter, and they matter in a very negative way. And if you're ever wondering why the world is going to hell in a handbasket, the first place to look to determine that is in the mirror. And so 
And, and in that, you know, there's a nobility in that too. And I also think, you know, that you actually can't take yourself seriously until you take your capacity for stupidity and bitterness and resentment seriously and understand how much damage that can do in the world. Because when you can see in yourself as a force for evil, you can start to understand that the corollary of that could well exist. At least you could not be as wretched as you are, and then after that, perhaps you could aim up. And then maybe I could talk a little bit about how you might aim up. I have a program online called the Future Authoring Program, and it helps people develop a vision. And so, if you're looking for a practical way of developing a vision, finishing that program is a very good idea, and you can do it very badly, and it'll still work. And so, but, but I want to tell you what the idea behind the development of a vision is. You know, they say that without a vision, the people perish. And there's technical reasons for believing that. The first thing is, is that if you don't have a well-developed and integrated vision, you can't have any hope. And the reason you can't have any hope is because hope signifies movement towards a valuable goal. And so if you don't have a valuable goal in mind, you have no hope. And that's, that's not good, because there'll be times in your life where, well, you'll perish without hope. And so you need a noble goal that will fill you with hope. Now, the other thing that a goal does is it unites you inter internally. You know, and if you're a leader, you can unite many people behind a goal, but a goal of your own unites you internally. And what's the consequence of that internal union? And the answer to that is, apart from an abundance of hope, is an absence of anxiety. Because what anxiety does is signal a fractured vision. You're anxious when there's too many things that you don't understand that you could do, or too many directions that beckon that you could wander down. It's the freedom of being in the desert, or the freedom of being dropped in the ocean. Too much unstructured potential, and you put the proper constraint on potential with the vision. Okay, so now, a vision is something you negotiate. Let's say, if you're in a marriage, you have to negotiate the vision of the marriage with your wife or with your husband. Now, how, well, how does, what bearing does that have on what you do with yourself? Well, here's a very practical way of thinking about it. There's a cost that you're going to pay for being alive. And the cost is, well, the cost is your death. That's one. The cost is the suffering that will definitely come to you as you make your way through life. Now, if that suffering makes itself manifest in the absence of sufficient purpose, you will get bitter and resentful, and you'll work to make things worse. And that's not... Uh, desirable outcome if you're clear-headed in the least. And so then you might ask yourself, well, what's the alternative to that? And that's actually the question you should ask. So one of the things we ask people to do with this future authoring program is to sit down with yourself, let's say, like you would sit down with someone that you were taking care of, and to ask yourself, all right, well, what's my price for not being bitter? You know, like, what would I have to have in my life? What, what is it that I need in my life so that if that was delivered to me, I would be, how about thrilled? How about thrilled to do what I'm doing? And that's a good criteria to apply if you're negotiating for a new position at work. It's like, why not negotiate a contract you're thrilled with? Then you get to go to work and be thrilled. So then, well, would you negotiate a covenant with yourself that would enable you to be thrilled? Well, it's a game you can play. You know, if you could have the relationship you want, and you have to imagine, like you're a child, right, to enter that realm of dreaming that you did when you, when you, when you were daydreaming as a child, which is a form of thinking which we suppress very early in childhood to our, to our great, what would you say, loss. You can ask yourself in a meditative way, well, imagine that I had a genie and I could rub it and I'd have my wish. And my wish was that I could have the best intimate relationship that I could imagine. It's like, well, what would that look like? What would that look like? And you have to be honest with yourself to, to let that vision make itself manifest. You have to admit to yourself what you really want and need. And then you also have to admit to yourself the gap between where you are now and that actual endpoint. But at least that, in principle, can be motivating. And you can do that with your intimate relationship. You can do that with your friends. You can do that with your career. You can do that with your educational vision. You can do that with the service that you might be to others. You can do that with your own care on the mental and physical health dimensions. You can figure out how to regulate your response to temptation. It's like, if you could be the person that you, that you would most admire in some realistic sense, what is it that you would do and what is it that you would stop doing? And then you have to ask yourself, well, those are my conditions for satisfaction. That's what I want to pursue. And then, well, then you're motivated. And I mean, technically you're motivated. 
Because now you have some hope. You think, well, you know, if I accomplish that, well, then what? Then what? Then what? Well, I'd be, I might be pl as pleased as a reasonable person could be with the conditions of my own existence. I would exist in some degree of harmony in, with the social world around me. I would be able to, I would be able to fulfill the commandments, say, to act as if existence itself is good. And you have that capacity. There's a, there's a gospel suggestion. It's a very strange line. Christ says to his followers, if you knock, the door will open. If you ask, you will receive. And if you seek, you will find. And it's easy to deride that as a form of naive sentimentalism. And it's not that at all. It's the most practical possible advice that anyone could ever deliver. It's like, what do you want? You know, the world is, the world is full of endless difficult possibility. It's a, it's a, it's a, what would you say? It's an un, it's an unexplored storehouse of potential treasure. And there's no reason to assume at all that if you made the sacrifices that were necessary to bring yourself closer to the goal that you envisioned, that it would be impossible for you to attain that. Now, if you're wise, you'll know that, you know, you hold a vision, you hold a goal with a light hand, because as you approach it, you may find that you are unwise in your choice and that you have to modify your vision. But that's okay, you can accrue wisdom along the way, and it also means that you don't have to be afraid to stumble forward. You know, like, what the hell do you know about where you should be in four years? Well, maybe you can have a vision that would clarify you to some degree, and then when you get to that next point, you'll be able to see the location of the shining city on the hill more, with more clarity. So, in, if you develop a vision wisely, you can start from wherever you are, and you can stumble forward as stupidly as you need to, and you'll improve along the way, and, and God only knows what you might be capable of in the future. And that's a good question to ask yourself, too, you know. If you pulled out all the stops, and if you were all in, which you are anyways, right, which you are anyways, the worst thing you can possibly imagine is definitely going to happen to you. And so, you, there's no way around that. You can accept that as an a priori risk, and you can say, well, given that, given that limitation and that burden, how is it? How is it that I would like myself to, to make myself manifest in the world? And what would I want to bring about? You listen to Magach, she's an amazingly um, inspiring speaker. And why? Well, she has a vision for Africa. She said, you know, if she could see in 25 years that she had taken concrete steps to make the world's youngest continent more wealthier and more productive, that she could die what? Die what? Thinking that life had been worthwhile. Well, maybe that's a goal. So how do you die? thinking that your life is worthwhile. If you live a life that's worthwhile, you strike a bargain with yourself and you put it into practice. And we invited you here because that's what we hope you will do. And I think as well, I spend a lot of time thinking about tyranny and thinking about slavery and trying to understand how we fall prey to tyranny. We fall prey to tyrants when we do not act out the necessities of our own vision. They can offer us the blandishments that tyrants offer and we'll take them because we don't have anything of our own. It's like you can have something of your own, but you have to decide what it is. You have to discover what it is. You have to enter into a conversation with yourself and see if you can determine clear-headedly what your preconditions are to thrive in the world. And what we would like you to do as attendees here and to take forward as you, as you move back out into the world is the idea that you should think about what it is that is necessary for you to do so as someone that you're taking care of, as someone with intrinsic value. And to think as well, what does that mean about what you have to offer the world? And we're hoping that you're here, you're going to listen to a variety of people who are inspiring, a number of people who have done remarkable things with their lives as models for the fact that you can do, and not only can, but have a moral obligation to do remarkable things with this miracle of existence that has been granted to you with all its difficulties. And so you walk away from this conference thinking that the burden is on you, but so is the adventure and the responsibility, all the opportunity and possibility that goes along with that. And we're hoping that you take that dead seriously as your contribution to tilting the world away from hell and more closely approximating heaven. And that is your, that is your, what would you say? That's your ethical responsibility as someone made in the image of God. And so that's what we want.